<laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, people keep telling me that I talk too soon. So yes, we waited there. You got five seconds to get in. Did that work? Are you in? Yes. Oh, good. People are in. Excellent. So today we are talking about seascape photography, particularly about all of the gear that you need to pack, whether you're coming with us to Oregon next month, or you're going on your own trip, or maybe you're signed up to come to out of Olympic next May. Uh, this is everything you need to know for packing for the trip, everything you need to have. So today I am joined by Mark Denny. Hey, Mark. Hey, how's it going? Jennifer Renwick. And Blake Rudis. What's up, everybody? How are you? Woo we also have uh, Video Bob. He's back there running the show. And we also have uh, Chrissy Dunnity. She's in the chat, and she's going to be uh, handling things, helping out and putting links and answering questions. She's helping me. Uh, maybe I'm helping her run the whole Oregon event, and uh, she's been doing awesome. So uh, Chrissy's in there if you have questions. Um, if you have Chris, questions, It looks like the chat is disabled, just to let oh. everybody know. We'll have it on in a minute. I don't know what button it is that I hit wrong. Yeah, I yeah, happens, we're going to talk uh, to you about that. But, <laughs> yeah, you did talk to me about that, but apparently I didn't fix it. So uh, so Bob's going to go fix the chat again for the second time. And uh, and that's when once it's working, say hi to everybody. And um, if you have questions for instructors that you'd like them to answer and instructors, if you guys want to answer them as we go, best place to put that is actually into the Q&A rather than just putting it into the chat. So it just doesn't get lost in the mess of people saying hi to each other. Um, all right. So I just want to introduce these people a little bit better. You guys know Mark Denny, probably most likely from his YouTube channel. Mark's been with us for a really long time at Out of Chicago, and uh, we love him. He's an awesome instructor. He's going to be uh, at both weeks of Out of Oregon. You can go to his website, markdennyphotography.com. And uh, yeah, He's awesome in all ways. So Mark Denny, uh, <laughs> not sure what else to say there. Oh, good. It looks like the you covered are... it all. It was perfect. Yeah, that was it. That's all you ever need to know. Uh, Jennifer Renwick works with David Kingham uh, on exploring exposure. And she also has her own site. What's the, what's the site, Jennifer? <laughs> it's jenniferrenwick.com. JenniferRenwick.com, of course. See, I, this is what I always say is like, how come ChrisSmith.com wasn't available? But if, of course, JenniferRenwick.com was. Yeah. So uh, Jennifer is going to be with us uh, in Oregon as well. And we're super excited for that. Um, I don't know, Jennifer, if you'd consider yourself as much of a seascape photographer, more of an abstract and small scenes and known for her slow photography. And she's going to be taking that whole method and helping people with that type of stuff in Oregon. Did I say that right? You agree? Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> so then uh, Blake Rudis, if you don't know Blake, Blake, when's the first time you taught with us? Do you remember? Did you actually do like Chicago out of Chicago? Yeah. Yeah. 20... Right. 16. Yeah. Like yeah that was when you told me ago. I needed to rebrand or you wouldn't let me be an instructor. Uh, I didn't say that. <laughs> Would I do that? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, we just accurate. talked about all sorts of stuff back then, right? Because like you and I were both like just a couple few years into doing this. And uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, to see where you've gotten now where you are is unbelievable. Uh, he runs uh, what's called F64 Academy. Go to F64Academy.com or he said he's bought tons of all the different domains. So if you spell it wrong, you'll still get there. You can look that up. Uh, but Blake is known for his uh, photo Photoshop help. And uh, I think is really interesting. Last time he was with us in Oregon, and so was Mark. But last time I remember him talking about helping people on the beach and saying, I want to be able to then take these people and show them how you what you can do with that in Photoshop that goes so much further. So if you want to talk for a few minutes about that later too, Blake, I think that'd be a good idea. Because that's really Blake's an awesome photographer. But what sets him apart is his Photoshop ability. And that's been awesome. So all right. So Blake, Mark, Jennifer, you guys ready to start talking camera? gear yeah yeah all right um again say hi in the chat questions in the q a and we'll try and hit them as we go instructors if you want to try and answer things while someone else is talking i know that's a lot to handle but uh feel free you're welcome to all right so first thing you need is you're going to need a camera you're going to need possibly um well Blake Rudis, you're on this you talk about this what do people want to make sure they have in terms of a camera anything special there um, well, you know, when it comes to, to cameras and gear, um, I take like more of a, like a visionary approach to it. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you what kind of camera to buy, what kind of camera to bring. Um, I like to buy gear and things that are going to enable my artistic vision. 
So that's a good cop out for anyone who's like, well, my camera is, is this and it's five years old and it sucks. Well, that's great, but it's not about the camera. It's about what you can do as an individual with that camera. Uh, you give me a Polaroid on the beach and I think we could have some fun. I might even bring mine. Uh, so, uh, But you need a good solid, I would say at least weather sealed camera if you're going to do a lot of the beach photography that we like to do. Um, because most of the stuff we do is a, is a lot of low angle things. You know, we're getting... Uh, some these bigger tripods you see behind me, they're kind of in the dark there. Um, I can maybe turn those on a little bit with my other lights, but um, yeah, there we go. There's some more light for you. Um, so those bigger tripods, I mean, those are great for for getting high uh, um, eye level view, you know, five feet tall or, or higher, sometimes up to six feet, but uh, really to get that really engaging uh, water rushing towards you, you got to get down to sometimes a foot and even sometimes smaller with these teeny tripods that look somewhat like this too. Like I'll bring this because this packs up into a teeny tiny little bag. So this small tripod coupled with one of those big tripods and I've got my full range there. So if you're that low though, you have to be cognizant of two things. One, water is going to be rushing at you. And two, you're in Oregon. Um, Oregon is known for its rogue waves. I've taught two or three workshops there, uh, the one out of Oregon and also one of my own. And I've seen people just turn their back like this as they're trying to talk to me to get me to come over to them and their camera is starting to go away. <laughs> so be very cognizant that if you are near the water um, to have a hand on the tripod at all times uh, and be ready for water. So one of the things I like to bring with me too is, is these microfiber cleaning cloths. They're huge. Um, I bring these for two reasons. Um, one of them, if water comes up at me at my camera, I can either cover it up or I can clean it off. And I've got a bunch of those in my camera bag and also a bunch at the hotel. I think it's like 10 bucks for six of them on Amazon or something like that. Uh, but those work wonders for protecting your camera gear. So as far as the camera itself, though, I mean, that's pretty much up to you. I would definitely get something weather sealed, lenses that are weather sealed, because if that salt water gets in there, you could go from having a great photography trip to a really bad one really quick. And I'm sure Mark and Jennifer can attest to that as well. Yep. Yeah. Mark, are you a uh, uh, bring an extra camera body type of guy when you go on these big trips or or is it is it one camera and you're good? No, no, I, I always bring a backup. I have my uh, Fuji X-T4 that I usually used for recording video, but it also serves as a backup camera, which is always a, a good best practice to get into because as, as awesome as these cameras are nowadays, they they I, I have an issue at least every year with a camera just completely stop working, whether it's battery issues or software issues or firmware issues or whatever the case may be. And these events, they're short, you know, they're only five days long. So if you have a, a snafu, you could spend a couple of days with no camera trying to fix it. So having a backup is pretty imperative. Yeah. Spending all that energy, time, you know, money to, to yeah. get to that location and then have your gear fail you is a problem. So something as a backup is always good. Um, Jennifer, anything else you can say about making sure that your gear is weather sealed? Is that, is that something you're always looking for? Yeah, I think that's really important, especially anytime you're around water, whether it's the ocean, rivers, streams. Um, and I'll agree with what Blake said. I mean, it's, and I'll add that, I think it's very important to be comfortable with your gear. Um, I know a lot of people feel motivated to go out and buy the latest and greatest before some big photography trip. Um, but what I find is that it, and it leads to a lot of frustration because you don't want to be fiddling with a brand new camera when you're in a place trying to be creative, take photos, really get the most out of your experience. So when I think of camera gear, the best to me is the one that I'm comfortable with, not necessarily the latest and greatest, but um, because if you're comfortable, you're going to want to be more creative. You're not going to be fiddling with technical issues. You, you know, familiar set, familiarize yourself with all your buttons. So you're not on the beach going, oh, I'm going to catch this wave. Oh, wait, no, oh, wait, I got to change this. Um, we see it often in our workshops. So that's the biggest takeaway from, you know, other than being weather sealed, just to make sure you're comfortable with your gear, you know, practice with it at your house. Um, but yeah, comfort is important because then you can be more creative without worrying about the technical problems. Yeah, we, we have a whole list of all the gear that we kind of want to talk about, but maybe the most important things are knowing how to use that gear. Exactly. And that's like my biggest piece of advice. Like when I get a new camera or I get a tripod, like I just 
practice with it, like, uh, you know, around the house, like all the time, you know, setting and tripod up, putting it back down, uh, locking it down. So it's ready to go. I, I think that's maybe the number one thing that we see on our events is people that don't know how to truly make their tripod lock down and be ready to go. And, and you get a camera flopping over. I see lots of, yeah, our instructors agreeing with that. And, and they're just, they just don't know exactly how it works. Well, when we come to Oregon and we do our opening night and we get to see our instructors before we go out onto the excursions, that's a good chance to say, hey, would you just check out the tripod? Would you make sure I'm doing everything right? Because I can't tell you how many times I've just been on things and be like, well, you're actually not quite using this right. So yeah. So speaking of tripods, Mark, let, what do people want to do in terms of bringing a, a tripod for, for something like Oregon or shooting on the coast? So I think that the, the tripod feet that you use is probably just as important as the actual tripod itself. And, and most tripods come with, can you see that? Yeah. Come mm -hmm. with this kind of foot. It's just like your standard rubber foot. But most of these screw off and you can get different replacement ones. So I use these kind. This is actually, it's called a claw. And I think this is a really good kind of multi-purpose foot for, for shooting like woodland, shooting seascape, shooting on rocks. This is a very kind of grippy type of a tripod foot. But these are really cool as well. So I'm sure you've probably seen these before. These are tripod spikes, but you can actually take these a step further and they make these that go with it. And the way these work is it goes like that and it screws right into the bottom of your tripod, which is really, really good for shooting in snow and shooting along the coast. So if you were to just shoot along the coast with a, a spike like this, every time a wave comes by, your tripod is gonna slowly get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. And before you know it, you're shooting those close-up shots that Blake was talking about when your camera is like six inches above the, uh, the water, which is not always a bad thing, but if your tripod has the ability to unscrew its feet, and you might not even be aware that it can do that, you know, if you're not sure, just grab your tripod and start trying to take your, the feet off. And these are really, really cheap. You can get, uh, I shouldn't say that, you can get some from like really right stuff. That are about $100 <laughs> a piece. Yeah. <laughs> but this one right here, this is a generic one. And I think the set of these was $30, which once again, isn't super cheap either, but it's it's a lot cheaper than cameras. But I would just say that the type of feet that are on your tripod are really, really important. And then perhaps the, the most important thing that I have learned the hard way in regards to tripods and the coast has, and I'm gonna try and show this on camera, has to do with the order in which you extend the tripod legs. So hopefully this isn't ridiculous, but most people, when they take out their tripod, you always take it from the top bottom. So you unscrew this one and you go on all the way out. But when you're shooting in the sea and you have a foot that's in the water, the best thing to do is to start with this foot first, because this is going to be the section that's in the water and there's no joints here. So you can extend this all the way out. And ideally this whole area here is what is submerged in the water. But when you do it the other way, this whole area here, this is what's submerged in water. And these are all the joints. And these will absolutely get completely mucked up in sand. And they'll become extremely hard to open and close. But just making that one tiny adjustment by putting this leg in the water will save you so, so much time. I just dump sand all over my desk. <laughs> <laughs> it's covered in sand. But yeah, we've all been there. Yeah, but it's a, it really does save you a lot of time. And it's not, actually, it's not even a seascape thing. When you shoot waterfalls or streams, say in the Smokies, same thing happens. If you put your joints in the water, you're going to get sand and dirt and mud and all kinds of stuff with the water flowing through there. So that's something that has uh, saved me a lot of time. Yeah, I, I think the advice is that you would like to have the larger legs extended to be more sturdy. But in the case of putting it into water at all, you don't want to listen to that advice. You want to make sure none of your joints are under the water. Yeah. Ideally, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, ideally, of course. Yeah, you might have to get all the way in the water. Who knows? Um, Blake, you want to talk? Uh, what, what, first off, there's a question. What was that uh, tripod that you showed, that smaller one? Do you know the, um, the brand of that one? Um, I buy really cheap stuff. So <laughs> this one <laughs> is um, newer legs with a me photo head when it comes to this kind of stuff it really doesn't matter because it's so lightweight anyway so if you get carbon fiber and you try to get like a really expensive one you're either a gonna lose it 
or B, it doesn't necessarily matter because they have extendable legs, but they only extend like four inches. So there's really no point anyway. And they're really not good. Like this is one of the tripods that I use on my desk as a, a video uh, tripod. Uh, but I do pack this with me when I go on trips. And then it's a me photo um, ball head. Ahead, yeah. So mm -hmm. nothing special when you're that close to the ground. I mean, it doesn't really matter much. And I think I spent maybe 35, 40 bucks on that setup. And therefore, I'm not too concerned with it getting beat up and junked up anyway. So Right, yeah. right. I, I have a similar one. It's like got plastic legs and stuff, and it's crazy. But it actually has a decent ball head on it, and it's sturdy, and it works great, especially like if you're going in salt water, and it's like I'm just not that worried about it. So, so I'll say this. I'm comfortable like putting that. a Sony A1 on it. So Sure, yeah. If I'm that comfortable with it, I think you'd be comfortable with that too. You know, I trust, I trust the gear because I use it, so. I think it's a good time, Jennifer, to talk about uh, like when you're done with your shoot, like you go out, you photograph the sunrise and you got your tripod in the water and you got sand on all your gear. What do you do at that point to make sure that to just to clean stuff off before you go, you know, before you go out again? Yeah. So anytime that I get done shooting on the coast or the beach, um, my first step is actually the little showers on the beach <laughs> um, where the surfers rinse off. And I will just rinse all of my tripod legs off in that. Um, I inspect my joints. You know, if I hear anything crunchy, I'll take it home actually that night and just hit the problem early, take it apart. That's another thing. Um, you should always be familiar with how to take your tripod apart in case you do have to do some maintenance or cleaning on it. Um, because no matter how meticulous you are, we use our gear in the field, it's going to get dirty, you know, and you just want to know how to care for it properly. Um, but rinsing with fresh water is the number one tip that I could say after being in salt water, because salt um, or salt water is actually more corrosive than people actually think. So if you do just say, oh, I'll just rinse it off tomorrow or the next day, you do risk a chance of corroding something and your joints may not work properly. Um, so yeah, definitely the fresh water rinse, super important. Let's go on to talk about lenses. Uh, Mark, like uh, what what types of lenses would you recommend for people? And then it's different depending on what you're going to be shooting. But uh, what are you going to pack when you go to Oregon uh, as far as shooting seascape type stuff? So I'm going to bring the, the widest lens that I have, which is about a full frame equivalent of 18 millimeters. I'm going to bring a, a mid-range zoom and also a, a telephoto. So basically that, that holy trinity of lenses. I think it's one of the coolest things about the Oregon coast is that there's so much diversity, uh, so many different things that you can photograph. So I would probably say that the telephoto lens is probably the lens that I might use the least, but I would never want to leave it at home. So I'm going to have all three of my lenses with me in the bag. Blake? Same. Um, I, I'm... <laughs> Matt Glaskowski and I once were on a trip and he was shooting with telephoto and I was shooting with a wide angle. It was just funny with us next to each other, but so you know what they say, Matt, go wide or go home. And he's like, like, nobody says that. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was shooting 10 millimeter. I have a 10 millimeter Voigtlander on a full frame camera and he was shooting 400 millimeters. It was just funny. But so I, I tend to overpack on the wide angle side um, just because I, I really enjoy that wide open expanse that happens at 10 millimeters that you don't really see unless you've like seen 10 millimeters before um so i'll, I'll take a 10 millimeter possibly 12 millimeter if i want to leave the 10 millimeter at home i'll take a 12 uh and then i have 16 to 35 typically 24 to 105 and then a 100 to 400 um and again i'm kind of like marking that where i like to and the reason why okay and i think that's that's the big important piece is that i like to look at every scene as having personalities i did a youtube video on this before and if you think about when you first meet someone you meet them at a wide angle perspective i mean you're just looking at like it's it's a basic conversation it's usually about the weather it's so wide it's so open right but as you start to get to know someone better it starts to tighten in and get more and more narrow and narrower and narrower and narrower so like my wife she has like a 600 millimeter perspective on me and I might have like a 100 millimeter perspective on her just because I'm a dude. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> but so I do the same thing in my landscape. So I'll, I'll, I'll start wide as getting those journalistic type of shots. And then I slowly narrow down into a, uh, a smaller or I should say a longer focal length so that I can zoom in on, on particular areas to get the personality of the scene so that I'm not just stuck with a bunch of wide angle shots. I now have a whole range that talks about the whole 
the whole space, right? So not just the wide angle space, but also maybe narrowing down to like what it looks like when a wave splashes and it's at one, you know, six thousandth of a second, you see the little drops coming off of the top versus a wide angle perspective where you can't see that kind of stuff, you know? So that's why I like to have that, that, that range of lenses because I can, I can go there with my vision. I can talk to this place and feel this place. I don't really meditate. I mean, I'm actually a very like, what do you call it? Logistic person, but um, it gives me, it gives me opportunity. It gives me opportunity to capture everything about that space. So. All right. And and Jennifer, you do more uh, abstract. I mean, you do this as well, but you do a lot of abstracts. You do a lot of uh, small scenes, close up more type stuff on the beach as well. Do you recommend an actual macro lens or what do you do when you're doing that stuff? Yeah. So um, similar to these guys, I like to maximize my opportunities when I'm at any foot, like photography location. So even though we're on the coast and it's ample for wide scenes, there are so many little stories along the beach if you just take the time to kind of slow down and look. So I like to, you know, instead of coming home with just one photo telling a story, I like to come home with a bunch of little stories within that one photo. So I use a wide angle. I've got a 14 to 24. I do a mid range. I've got a telephoto, but I will add a macro to my um, coastal kit, so to speak because there's a lot of interesting things on the beach. Um, You've got sand, you've got little critters walking around, you've got the tide pools. Um, One of my favorite things to do is especially kelp. Um, That's pretty prolific off the coast. It washes up onto the shore. Kelp has amazing patterns if you take the time to use a macro and kind of investigate those. Um, So yeah, I, I do think there's definitely use for a macro on the coast, even though it you know, we're shooting these wider scenes. Um, there are little stories and nuances that you can easily catch with your lens to tell as well. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have a macro, you could use like your telephoto and use extension tubes or something like that. Uh, Definitely. As long as, I mean, I could, I'd even use it like with my 100 to 500 millimeter lens and put an extension tube on, as long as you can stand up and shoot down and you're not within that minimum focus distance and you can still do that. That's kind of fun to just walk around and keep shooting stuff on the ground. So, mm-hmm. so it doesn't have to be a macro lens, but who doesn't love a good macro lens, right? Uh, yeah. All right. So, so that's lenses. Someone asked also about changing lenses. Uh, We know that when we are in Death Valley and there's wind and sand and everything, do we need to worry about those things with the water as well? Um, I'll throw that out to whoever would like to answer that. Yeah, I think, I mean, especially if it's windy, you know, if it's a calm day, I mean, I I generally am not very nonchalant about changing lenses anyway. I'll never unhook a lens from a body and then just kind of like walk around with the cap off or anything like that. I try and, and do it pretty quickly. But whenever I take the cap off, I always try and keep it down instead of like pointing up or anything like that. So I think that that's probably a good best practice. Or if it is windy, put your back to the wind and keep the camera or the lens in front of you. But, you know, use do everything you can to try and minimize the uh, the amount of time your shutter is exposed or the uh, the interior elements of your camera or of your lens are exposed. And I personally wouldn't recommend having your camera on a tripod and detaching the lens from it with the camera just completely exposed with the sensor pointing straight out. I would just take the extra 10 seconds, take your camera off the tripod, point it the camera body down on the ground like this, and then do your changing this way. I find that that's probably the best way to keep your, your most delicate electronics is, uh, is safe from um, sea salt as possible. Yeah. And I don't think this was on our list, but uh, how about lens hoods? You guys use your lens hoods? Yes. No. Yes. For sure. Absolutely. Sometimes. Sometimes. I don't know. I I always use my lens hoods. I just feel that uh, just even for protection, like if if something happens and and your tripod does fall, that it's there to protect it. I think it's the best way to protect the front of it, but also from sea spray. And uh, there's not a whole lot of reasons not to have it, but there's a lot to have it. So so especially in these situations, I recommend you make sure you, I mean, I've seen people on our things and they're like, oh yeah, I think something came with my, yeah, I should have brought that. Yeah. So, (laughs) so I recommend you have your lens hood as well. Uh, all right. We ready to do, uh, filters. That's a big one for this, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's actually, let's go to Blake. Blake's got some, some photos he's going to share. He's going to talk about, uh, the number one filter that we need to make sure I think we want to have is uh, some sort of a circular polarizer. So Blake, you want to share some photos and talk a little bit about that. And, uh, yeah, he's even got something that goes one step further than that. Right. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and share my screen. And I, I'm, 
I'm really fond of these uh, circular polarizers that have an ND built into the circular polarizer. So just to give you some backstory, I've used Lee filters. I've used uh, just about every brand of square filter where you got the part that goes on the front of the camera, then you put the, the blocky piece there, then you got the four inch filter that goes in. Um, and while I like those because on wide angle lenses, you don't get the, uh, the vignetting around the edge of the, of the barrel, um, I find that there's a lot of pieces and working, especially in a place like the Oregon coast where it doesn't seem like it's going to be that big of a deal, but put yourself under a little bit of dress when a wave is coming at you and there's a bunch of stuff going on, the less pieces, the better, right? So uh, I like a circular polarizer that has ND built into it. So what that is, is if you've ever seen a circular polarizer before, it's um, you turn it and as you turn it, it helps cut the reflection of the sun. And as long as you're in the right position, which I believe is um, anywhere behind 90 degrees of the sun, then you're okay. So as you spin it, the, the filter will cut reflections that are coming off of the water. It cuts reflections that are coming off of uh, waterfalls. And it's even it even gives you like see-through possibilities where you can see through water and you see the rocks underneath. So have you ever seen these images where you know the, the water looks like it's moving nice and slow, but you can see all the rocks underneath and it looks all beautiful? It typically is because they're using some type of circular polarizer to cut the reflections that are coming there. So I'm going to share my screen and just show you a couple. Let, let's just talk about that just real quick before you do share your screen. Sorry. Let's just make sure we're all good on a polarizer and all good on an ND filter. And then you can share both together. Ah, so, so the, the, sorry to change my mind on that. So uh, the <laughs> polarizer. Yeah, absolutely. Just what you're saying that um, it's going to cut down on reflections. And a lot of us have like uh, polarized uh, sun, polarizing sunglasses. Right. And so I remember my son and I are on the bridge looking down at the fish and I'm like, how can you not see all the fish? And he's like, I don't see any fish. And I, oh, I tried my glasses and all of a sudden, boom, all the glare is gone and you can see the fish. So it's the same thing. If you want to eliminate that glare, the reflection off the water, that's why it's so important with seascape photography that you have that, that circular polarizer. <laughs> And uh, yeah, to be able to rotate it. And you could do the same thing with your glasses too. You guys can try this, right? You take your glasses and you just turn them sideways and it doesn't work anymore. Like they have to be in the right orientation, just like turning your circular polarizer. So um, yeah, I don't know. Like this That's is dumb, perfect. sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to take it one step further. Like I have like the heads up display on my card, you know what I'm saying? But with my glasses on, I can't see it. Yeah, but yeah. if I turn my head and do that, I can. So if you just <laughs> if you see me driving along doing that, then you know why. Yeah, that totally works. So that's, that's how the circular polarizer works on the front of your uh, lens. That you turn it, and and it will allow that uh, that reflection through or cut it down. Um, and then Which, what, Mark? Would you just talk real quick about using an ND filter? Blake's going to share some things where it, where it, I, I like this idea. It's a combination of both. Um, but but Mark, you know. It, are you going to bring ND filters for, for this? Obviously you shoot a lot of waterfalls and you're yeah. using them for that. Will you explain what it is and, and, and why people would want them here? Yeah. So we'll just stick with the sunglass theme here. Sun, <laughs> a, a, an, an ND filter is just that it's sunglasses that go on front of your lens, which ultimately reduces the amount of light that's coming into your camera which enables you to slow down your shutter speed just a little bit. That's how you get the lots of nice texture in moving water. I have probably every filter you can imagine, but the really the only ND filter I use is a three stop or maybe a six stop. I very rarely use a 10 stop. And I would say the most, most of the time I'm really not even using an ND filter, but I always bring them with me. And the reason why I don't use them constantly is because I like to show as much texture in the water as I possibly can. It's just personal preference, but I, I personally don't like the overly creamy or kind of milky looking water. Some people love it and, and, and that's fine. It's just, I like to show that the water is moving while at the same time retaining as much detail as possible. And in order to do that, you generally can get away with that with a pretty quick shutter speed still. So one fifteenth of a second, maybe a 25th of a second. A lot of it depends on how quickly the water is flowing, but you usually don't need to do, you know, add a six stop ND filter to kind of get that look. But I always have the ND filters with me and a three stop and a six stop are probably the ones that I would reach to first before the polarizer. Polarizer is definitely my, uh, my go-to filter. Other than the black mist filter, but that's a totally separate topic. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, 
I don't even know what that is. All right, interesting. So, all right, excellent. Yeah, bring <laughs> bring it to uh, to Oregon. Great. So, so yeah. So Blake, go ahead. Let okay. talk about these uh, filters that kind of do both. Like like, and first off, like a regular just circular polarizer probably has like one stop of. ND capability, half a stop, something like that. I think I actually bought one that cost more so that it didn't have any ND, you know, so that it was just polarizing. But but I like what you're talking about here. Um, and so go ahead, share share your screen and tell us tell us what it is that you're using. Okay. So um, you see my screen now? Cool. Yeah. All right. So on that too, we, we talk about cutting the glare of water, but it also helps um cut the reflection on um, leaves too. So if you're doing oh, yeah. fall foliage photography, these CPL filters, just a CPL in general, is gonna help you cut the reflection on even glasses. If you're photographing people, uh, it can help cut the reflection on, on glasses. It can help cut the reflection on cars. There's many benefits to it. And one of the things it also does, is it adds contrast to your image as well. So you see this image here, and this is a waterfall. And this was in South Dakota, in the Badlands area, the Black Forest. and you know, I was photographing at midday. It's it's hideous light, but this was with a six stop ND filter on, uh, and because it's midday, the six stop was great for helping me slow down the shutter speed a little bit more. But if we look at it, what the difference here? Look at all the glare that's happening. You know, in between the rocks here, and then look at the water. Now look at the difference when you actually have an ND filter on. ND filter plus circular polarizer. Look at how you can actually see the water coming down and there, there's no reflection at all, period. Every glare that you could see in the original image is gone and you can actually see some of the, the water underneath the rocks. Now, if I'll go back to the other image and you'll just watch. I mean, we go from like dumpster hideous to like, wow, we can actually do something with this, right? So like this, it's just not good because we can't, there's, it's texture on top of texture on top of texture on top of texture on top of texture with the light glare here we've cut through a lot of that light glare texture just to show you what the subject is. So I use this a lot in my workflow. I use it a lot in my, in my shooting here. I'm on top of Rocky Mountain National Park, uh, shooting out into the distance. You obviously you see the fall foliage here. I will tell you that this filter did a wonderful job of helping me get the fall foliage separated from the green a little bit better because of the way it deals with contrast, even all the way back here into the uh, into the the trees back here, you can still see that there's some fall foliage back there as well. Um, you know, just another example of it cutting through the reflections on a waterfall so that we get the blackness of the rocks, the dark uh, contrast there. And that's what helps this work because, you know, in anything when it comes to tones in our image, highlights are gonna navigate the viewer throughout the piece. Dark areas are gonna create boundaries and mid-tones navigate them around those highlight areas. So they're gonna go right to the highlight areas first, navigate around, and then these black areas become stopping points. Um, so it's all about control over those stopping points uh, when it comes to that contrast there. But even using it um, now in a coastal seascape environment um, in, in Acadia uh, to get the, the, the reflection cut off of the rocks while also getting the slow moving water of the water on top. This is, I think, three or four exposures that have been combined to get this effect. Um, again, Rocky Mountain National Park, we're looking through the water. We can see the stuff that's happening underneath the water because we've cut the reflection of that water and also helps slow it down in the process. Another one from Acadia where you know, we're, we want to see what's happening under the water so that this rock out here can look like it's you know, rising above all the other stuff to help it tell a story some more. If we didn't have a you know, circular polarizer on while we did this, this wouldn't be very helpful. Um, this, again, uh, Acadia seeing through the, the water so that you can get some detail underneath while also cutting the reflection. It's not gonna cut all the reflection as you can see here, but it will cut that reflection that's most closest to you. Obviously we, don't want, we are not gonna be able to see through the water back here. So we're gonna get that reflection, uh, but it's gonna help. Again, just seeing through the water, seeing the contrast in the leaves, seeing the contrast in your colors come out. And the ND aspect of things, uh, there was a, an image that I photographed in, um, in Olympic National Park. And this was actually a workshop that I had done. We were actually staying there watching this at four o'clock in the afternoon. Now this is with a 10 stop ND filter, not with the polarizer, but with a 10 stop ND filter um, that I actually, no, it was a 20 stop because it was right after the solar eclipse. I bought a 20 stop ND filter and this is an eight minute exposure. And I was in the middle of teaching anyway. So I figured whatever, this is the regular exposure. This was the eight minute exposure. 
And I took the best of both worlds and kind of combined them together to get what my vision was. So again, my vision for this was that we would have a beautiful sunset. We didn't, but can I make it a beautiful sunset? Can I make it look like something otherworldly because we're in an otherworldly place? Now, could I have done that without an ND filter? No, I, I couldn't have slowed this down at all. It was four o'clock in the afternoon. The lowest the exposure I could get on this, even at F22, probably would have been maybe one one hundredth of a second or something like that uh, with my ISO at 50, right? So in order to do an eight minute exposure, I had the 20 stop ND filter on there, which I found out was overkill anyway. It would have been fine with the 10 stop ND filter, but the point is I needed to slow that water down to make these C stacks look like they were popping out. And then I combined them later. And this is what my vision created from the gear that I used. So the gear isn't necessarily as important as why you're using the gear to ensure that it's going to uh, match your vision for what you have for the space or the place that you're shooting in. Awesome. All right. Great shot. So, so the questions here, Blake, are that's that's just one piece. That's not two filters stacked on top of each other. It's one that's nope. that does both things, right? Um, yeah. What are some companies that would make something like that that we could find? So the ones that I have are from Breakthrough. Uh, we had Breakthrough Photography out at the 2019 one. That's where I found out about them. I never even know they existed. Um, and then uh, Nisi makes them too. So if you just look up CPL plus ND filter and just do a Google search for it, you'll probably find something to that effect. Um, now, if you don't, I would suggest you also have a CPL with you. So I don't just carry just this six stop CPL ND. I also carry a regular CPL with me because there's gonna be times where let's say the sun is set. I don't want to have this on there, but I want to have the benefits of the CPL. So I'll bring a CPL and I'll swap those out if I need to as well. But this, this six stop and the three stop cousin of it, ever since I bought these, I have stopped using my square filters. It's just, there's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of pieces and I really enjoy those. So then what I did was I just made sure I bought filter adapters for all my lenses to go up to the 82 millimeter filter, which is my biggest uh, lens that I have. So this, I buy one 82 millimeter filter, and then I can put that on all my lenses because they all have an adapter that goes from 74 to 82 or 78 to 82. Yeah, I think the number one reason people use like the rectangular or square filters like that is for like the graduated neutral density filters, right? So that, you know, the top half is, is darkened and the bottom's not. And, they, you know, do you guys use those at all nowadays or is that all done in post-processing? Mostly post for me. Mm -hmm. Same. Yeah, me, me too. Yeah, I remember I had those. They got all scratched up. And then I was like, how about I just use Photoshop? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, now you just do it in Lightroom now. So yeah, yeah. mainly just because when you, when you, when you do it with a filter, a graduated filter, that's what they call a destructive workflow because you can't undo that. Right. So exactly. that, and I can't tell you how many times I put in a filter just slightly off the horizon and it sticks out like a sore thumb when you're shooting seascapes, but you can easily do the same thing in Photoshop and you can do it over and over and over and over again. So it's not destructive that way. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Great advice. Uh, Jennifer, someone here is asking about uh, if we're not in, we're in a situation where we don't want an ND filter. We don't want a circular polarizer. Uh, would we consider, do you use just like an infrared or just a clear filter to help protect the front element then of your lens? I used to use UV filters quite a bit, um, especially when I first got into photography. I honestly, I haven't used one in probably about five years. Um, yeah, I probably put a little risk into that. Um, I've also had, you know, in the rare case that I've had something happen to my front element, it's actually not very noticeable um, on the actual image. Um, a lot of that surprises people. Um, it doesn't hurt to always be protective. Um, it doesn't hurt to have the UV filter on if you want that little extra insurance of protection. But I've found, you know, if I'm shooting into the sun, you know, the lens hood really helps. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's, you know, if you want it, go for it, but you definitely don't need it. Anyone? And I will just. No, oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I will add um, for those of you with circular filters, if you're looking for a nice way to organize everything, I got this off Amazon. I think it's called Tayoka, um, but you can fit six filters in. And if you're really awesome and cool, there's a belt loop. So you can wear them. Can you <laughs> uh, solid. Um, I can't wait to see you wearing that. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> totally. Um, 
but yeah, but overall, it's just a nice little case. I keep it inside my camera bag. It's just easy to quickly grab and put back and keep things organized. And there's a spot for step up rings too. So just a little plug if you're looking for something to organize all your yep. filters. I got the same kind of thing. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, it does have, I can put it on my belt. Never see? even considered that. Wow. Huh. We should all wear our filters on I our know, belt. I see a photo. Yeah. yeah. To the opening party. For yeah. Sure. <laughs> All right. I love it. Anything else you guys want to add about filters or any other questions I missed here? Um, well, I, I think, yeah, actually the question that just came in is, is just cleaning that salt spray off of the front, whether it's off of your polarizer or off of whatever, what advice can you guys give people for that? Mark? I would say probably the, the best piece of advice is to before you clean it, blow it off. Mm -hmm. Because so many times it might look like there's really nothing on your filter or even your lens, but there could be the tiniest bit of sand. And if there's just one speck of sand and you start wiping, you can really scratch your lens. I would definitely blow first and then do whatever kind of cleaning solution. I use these, or these little Zeiss cloths and I have them everywhere and I keep them in my jacket pockets. So whenever I'm there out on location, I can just immediately pull them out, but I always wanna blow off the filter or blow off the lens before you start wiping them. Yeah, anything else to add to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good yeah. advice. All right. Um... You know, I will say, if anyone would like to join us, we're all going to be there in Oregon. If you'd like to join us, uh, I'm going to set up a discount code for anyone watching this, and it's just going to be gear webinar, and uh, you save $250 off of uh, signing up for uh, Oregon week two, which is October 16th through the 20th. So it's right around the corner. If you want to join us, we'd love to have you. We got a couple spots left. And really, if you look at the rest of our schedule, including Olympic and all of our events next year, we're kind of sold out on everything. Uh, Oregon's a little crazy because it was so sold out. We added a second week, but uh, yeah, we still got a couple spots in the second week. So it's perfect. Um, all right, let's go on to some of the other little things that you're always going to need, right? Extra batteries, your charger, memory cards. Actually, do you have a special case for your memory cards, Jennifer? Not that I you're do. talking about having special cases. She brought her whole bag with all the stuff, right? Ooh, that's Ooh. a good one. Uh -huh. Does it have a belt loop, though? It does not have a belt loop, so. But there is a loop. I could probably fashion something, so. <laughs> No. I always joke that uh, that I bring my Pelican case, but that's just my yeah Pelican case for my uh, yeah memory cards. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. So, but but this one's nice. It's waterproof and it is uh, it'll float. So uh, if somehow it gets out, but really keep it with your bag, and as long as your bag doesn't float away, right, you're good. Uh, any other advice with just extra accessories like like that kind of stuff? Obviously, we know we need to have extra batteries, all that. Uh, Mark Blake, anything else to add to that part of things? Um, not necessarily. Um, uh, if you're doing any, I mean, those kinds of things I think to me are a little self-explanatory, just making sure you have the extra batteries and they're charged, um, yeah. when you go out, uh, typically my workflow, when I get done, uh, from any one of these things is I'm going to, as soon as I get back from a, from an excursion, I'm going to come back to my computer. I'm going to put my card into my computer, download them onto my computer, download them onto an external hard drive. So I'm in two places and then I'll usually wipe the card in my camera because I've got it in two places. I'm good to go. My, my cards fresh for the next day. And I make sure that I format it. I'm, I'm, I format my cards a lot because I know that if, if you don't format your card for a while, you can have some issues with uh, uh, some of those memory cards going bad sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it, it pays to, to buy good memory cards. I will say that I learned that by getting into wildlife photography and shooting, you know, 30 frames a second with, uh, with the a one and having a card that can keep up with the buffer. Uh, those cards tend to be, more for wildlife photography, but they're really good memory cards. You know, I've seen people with budget memory cards. I see people with, that's the thing too. Like if you don't spend in the right place once, you're going to spend in the wrong place at least three times. And I've seen that with tripods on workshops where people think, oh, I'll just bring my grandmother's tripod that she gave me from 1982. Um, true story. My mom handed me down that tripod and I had that tripod for about 20 years until I realized oh, this thing ain't cutting it. <laughs> right. Uh, having a good sturdy tripod, just making sure that what you're, what you're bringing with you is, is good quality stuff. Um, with that being said, you don't have to buy like the most expensive thing, just make sure it's good quality. Uh, but that's about all I'd have on that. 
All right. And people are asking about headlamps. Yes. Especially sunrise, sunset. You want to have some sort of a headlamp flashlight for sure. Um, and it just seems that uh, that's the way we are as photographers, especially shooting sunset, right? Is we're like, oh, it's just, it's bright right now when I go down there and then you just keep shooting and you keep shooting and you keep shooting and they're like, it's totally dark and I'm not sure how to get back. So yeah, for sure. Uh, make sure you have a headlamp at least on one. lights too. If you want me to talk about lights. Yeah, go ahead. Have you seen these panels? lights before luma cube makes like a that. panel light and then there's also also an off brand that's made on amazon and these are great because they they can go from one percent on the luma cube or five percent increments on the cheaper ones mm -hmm. and you know when you're doing any light painting you think oh, i'm gonna buy the biggest brightest nastiest flashlight i can because i want all that light well you just tap it a little bit and then the whole scene is too illuminated so these panel lights are great because it kind of like mimics the, the cell phone light that you get, which I often use my cell phone for light painting. And I'll just turn on my email application because it's all white. And then I would just kind of wave it like this and then put it in my pocket real quick. This is the same thing as that. Now, these are great because they also put out a lot of light if you need it. So you can use a little bit of light while you're on location, uh, light painting things and just light, lighting things up a little bit. But then if you're walking back to your cars, you can put it on 100% and you'll see like daylight in front of you. So... They're great for both of those. Uh, these panel lights are, are pretty nice to have and they charge very, very quickly. Sheila's on the same page as me. Remote shutter control. Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. Yes. Mark says no. The other two say yes. I say maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer, what, what say you? <laughs> um, I use one. I guess I use it like 50% of the time. I shouldn't say I use it all of the time. Um, it's always a good idea to have, um, you know, especially if you're in a situation where you don't want to bump your camera, it's always nice to have something separate. Um, but I, I do head out without mine quite a bit. So I think it's personal preference. Yeah. Mark? I just use a, a two second or a 10 second shutter, internal yeah. shutter release. That's yeah, what I, I do too. Well, there are some times when you do wish maybe with a wave yeah. crashing up that you could fire it right then. But I bet you're like me. You've gotten really good at going. I think it's going to be perfect in about two seconds, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, after after enough times, you, you get pretty good at timing it. But it's uh, it's just one more thing for me to carry, one more thing to, to plug in. And I just find myself that I, I just never really used them. That's why you got to buy the $5 ones off Amazon. Okay. And you just Velcro them to every tripod you have. Okay. <laughs> yep. And then you still do the two second timer, but then I can just be talking to you while I'm doing this. With that's the chair. <laughs> with the chair. <laughs> with the chair. <laughs> I'm bringing the chair with me. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. a lot of people swear by the remote release. Um, and yeah, if that's your workflow, then do it. Otherwise it, it can be done without it. And I do kind of agree with Mark too, that it's just an extra thing sometimes. And yeah, I remember shooting late at night and mine got snapped in my tripod legs. And I, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's like just having that extra cable going around. Yeah. It's just, it's a lot. And if you're trying to do some sort of a wireless thing and yeah, that's its own yeah. mess. Yeah. So two second delay. That's, that's kind of my deal. Uh, how about let's talk about maybe the most important thing is that's what we're going to wear. And uh, in terms of uh, boots, shoes, things like that too. Um, who wants to start? All right, Jennifer. No, oh, gosh. Sorry. <laughs> um, well, first, can I say one thing really quick? Can I also recommend a wrench that everyone carry with them to tighten things in the field? Um, that's usually something that I know a lot of people don't carry, but I have found it extremely useful. And I just want to pull a plug for L brackets. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I skipped mm -hmm. through that real quick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's talk L brackets. Go, Jennifer. Super convenient. Um, they will reduce the amount of frustration, especially if you want to go from landscape to portrait. Um, a lot of people that don't have them find that if you are switching to portrait, um, especially all of a sudden you'll get that creep where it'll just keep falling down. So then it's super frustrating because then you've got movement that you don't want in your image. Um, they're just really convenient. I use one all the time and I don't even think about it. Just super fast to switch definitely get one. It'll I just kind of think like if you're serious about photography, especially landscape photography, there is absolutely no reason not to have the L bracket, have an L bracket for sure. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. And get the one that's made for your camera. And yes. if you, if you are interested in getting an L bracket, I would recommend a uh, small rig. Yes. This one right here was I think $80, which might seem like a lot, but really right stuff has the same one on sale for 395. 
So, mm -hmm. and crazy. this one is and lighter too. To Jennifer's point, the small rig ones have the wrench magnetically built in. Yeah. Yep. Right yeah, in the bottom. Yeah. 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 Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. There's another sure. thing to hear. This is a company called um, uh, Alpha Skins or Alpha something or other, and they make wraps, 3M wraps that go on your camera. Oh. Um, and I think I got this wrap for like, I don't know, 50 or $60. Is it, it protective takes, or just so you look cooler? It's both. I mean, I, I definitely look cooler, look with cool. it, right? <laughs> but um, this, this is red because this is my IR camera. So I got a red skin to know that this is my infrared oh. camera. And then my other camera has a black camo skin on it. That way I know the two cameras while they're in my bag because they're both Sony's. I know that one's the infrared camera, one's the other one. But they're great because if you do get salt spray or something on them, you don't have to worry about it getting into many of the nooks and crannies because once you peel these stickers off, it doesn't leave a film on the camera and it protects it in the process too. It can also protect it from dings. It can protect it from salt. So, you know, even if you just get this one-time purchase uh, and it stays there and it's good to go, uh, that's great. But if you get back from your trip and realize that there's a bunch of salt water on it, it's not coming off or whatever, for whatever reason, you can just peel the sticker off and then get a new one. So. It's really convenient, cool. but you also look kind of cool in the process. I mean, this is like a red snake skin, something like that. Like you didn't already look cool enough, Blake. All right, so um, so we we only have a few minutes left, but maybe the most important thing is uh, is in terms of boots and that. Mark, what what are you going to bring for Oregon? So I uh, I bring these. Nick turned me onto these. He talks about them all the time. NRS boundary socks. Yep. They're, they're fantastic. This one right here, it actually has elastic at the top. So it creates a really good seal just beneath your knee and it'll keep your feet very warm. It obviously will keep your feet dry. If you notice the bottom here, there's no kind of like sole or anything to solve that. I just bought these kind of cheap. What are these speedo shoes from Walmart? I think these were nine 99 for the pair. And I just slipped these on the bottom here. And that creates a very, very good water solution. I mean, your feet will stay dry, your feet will stay uh, warm. And the NRS boundary socks, I think they were about $90. I've had mine for about six years and have never had any issues. And then the shoes were 10 bucks. So for $100, that's a pretty solid um, aquatic footwear solution. Mm. So you will be wearing a speedo right now through NRS. I think they're. I think I just paid like eighty or seventy nine dollars a few weeks oh. ago. So hopefully, yeah. yeah, if they're still on sale. So those are meant for if you're going into the water, or right. if you're going to be working really close and know that you're probably going to get hit. Like if you were just going to be up on the rocks, you wouldn't wear that. But when you right, or or would you? Yeah, like if I if I had no plan to get anywhere near the water at all, I would just wear my my standard boots that I wear. But if I have if I plan on getting in the water, even if it's just, you know, just a you know, a foot, then I'll definitely wear this type of a setup here. What do you recommend a lot of our situations will be? We just got to climb over some rocks and get down onto the beach and get to there. Um, and sometimes it may be slippery. What would you recommend, Blake? What would you recommend for that? Um, you know, coming from 20 years in the military, I really know good boot. So I definitely will spend three, $400 on a good boot. Um, and a lot of that, you want ankle protection specifically if you're going to be walking around on those cliffs and rock sides and stuff. And I would get something that has Gore-Tex in it. That's Gore-Tex lined, uh, for two reasons. It's going to keep your feet warmer. Uh, but at the same time, uh, it's also going to give you some waterproof protection unless it gets up and over the inside of the boot. Uh, but if it's Gore-Tex lined, it will pre pre predominantly be waterproof so that you won't get water into your feet. And that's really important in the event that you don't plan on going to the water. But if there looks like there's going to be a shot, then you have the best of both worlds. And I always wear a, a good pair of wool socks when I go on these trips. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm shooting in the summer, I'm wearing my boots and my wool socks. And you think, oh, wool socks in the summer. But they actually keep you pretty well temperature regulated to keep you cool when it's hot and uh, warm when it's cold. So uh, I, wear, I wear a good, almost knee length um, wool sock and boots that have good ankle protection that are Gore-Tex lined. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, what else can you add to that? Or what, what else should we be thinking about when we're packing for the trip in terms of what to wear? Um, I would say definitely layers. Um, it's always good. And, you know, have a nice base layer that's not cotton. I think that's really important. Um, I always have a hat and a puppy in my bag just because, I mean, I know it'll be, you know, fall, so it could be cool. 
um, but always best to dress in layers so you can take off if you need or add more if you want. Um, I usually wear just like my hiking pants. Um, they dry pretty quickly. Um, I wouldn't recommend jeans um, just because they get super heavy and wet and very uncomfortable. Um, but yeah, I, just to follow up, I think what Blake said about, you know, foot protection, ankle protection, you know, you're, you're definitely not wearing flip flops out there, um, super sharp things. So yeah, just good footwear, comfy clothes, warm clothes. And what about, I don't, we didn't mention this. Do you use, do you guys use anything um, like, like a rain cover for your camera, for your lenses, or are you just doing all the other things we talk about to make sure that it's not a problem? Mark, is that something yeah i i really don't i usually take the rain covers that come with my bags and I, I never use them for the bags i actually use them for my camera so if i have my my tripod set up and my camera's you know attached to the tripod and i'm just waiting for sunrise sunset or waves or whatever but i'm not shooting i usually will take this bag and just set it over the camera there's no no sense letting you know salt water spray all over it and then whenever i'm ready to actually you know take an exposure then i'll just take it off real quick but I usually don't leave my camera just sitting out there exposed if there's a lot of sand or sea spray blowing around. Mm -hmm. Blake, Jennifer, anything to add to that? No. About the same. I have one of those rain things that I got on Amazon like 10 years ago, and I think I've never used it, but it's in my bag in case I need it. <laughs> but I typically do the same stuff Mark does. I, I take those microfiber cleaning cloths and put those over yeah. top, uh, yeah. especially when I'm shooting waterfalls and stuff. Yeah. Uh, or the bag that kind of that that waterproofing bag is a great idea for that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I use the rain cover, like Mark just said. Um, I also use those microfiber cloths. Um, REI actually sells them in various sizes um, for not very expensive. So that's a good place to start looking for those. Um, someone mentioned a shower cap. Um, that's always a, you know, they're in the hotel rooms usually. So yeah. if you don't have anything, you can grab those before going out. Um, but yeah. Is there anything you guys brought to show people that we didn't get to anything, any little thing that, oh, we never even thought about this, but yeah, that's the one crazy thing I bring. Anything else? You guys in the comments, anything else uh, that we're not thinking of here? Because uh, we're going to shut this down in a second. Uh, if you guys, um, oh, someone was asking Blake about uh, what was the rap? What was the name of that company? Maybe. Um... It's Arrow Alpha Guard. Alpha, Alpha Guard, but it's spelled really weird. So just look up Alpha Guard camera wraps and you'll find it. And they don't just make them for Sony. I think they started out just making them for Sony, but now they've got Fuji and Nikon and Canon. They got all the cameras on there now. Awesome. All right. So for those of you joining us in Oregon or Olympic next year, I hope that this helps. Uh, I hope it helps when you're packing everything up and uh, what the pros do. Um, oh, I remember one little tip as far as packing all your gear up and that's not just for seascapes but i remember this one thing because i've seen it happen a couple times now is uh when you're packing your camera bag um take the lens off of the camera i would recommend uh sometimes you get away with it but i've seen camera snap because they left it on there i think uh, i would recommend to people that you take it off i know it's not really related to this but i don't like seeing that uh anything else to add for you guys all right anything else yeah. I mean, this is when we're going to these places, it's the number one thing people want to know is how do I pack? What do I need? So I think we hit so much of it here. And a lot of it I know is very basic. And you guys are like, I totally got this, but hopefully you got a nugget or two of wisdom from these guys. Um, I got a couple ideas actually from the comments and from you guys too. So uh, yeah. Oh, I, I'll also say last thing is if you're interested in ordering some of these things, we'll be... Um, working with Hunt's Photo. Hunt's Photo will be there uh, for part of the conference in Oregon. And um, if, you, if you're interested in buying anything, have questions on this gear, I recommend you reach out to Noah Buchanan. His email is n. Buchanan it has lots of A's in it. Buchanan uh, at huntsphoto.com. Uh, Chrissy could put it in the chat, but I know we're going to sign off here in a second. Um, so if people are asking about links to some of these things. We're going to put this video up on our YouTube and we'll have some of those uh, in the description. And uh, if you have questions, you can reach out to these guys. Um, definitely follow Blake Rudis, Mark Denny, and Jennifer Renwick. And if you have other questions, I'm sure they'd be happy to help answer them and would love to uh, get to know you. And uh, hopefully you're with us in Oregon. So that's it. I'm just stalling now, right? I'm done. <laughs> you're doing yeah? great. That's it. <laughs> All right.
You guys are the best. Thank you very much for doing this. Uh, so excited to hang out with you guys in Oregon. It's going to be great. And uh, great. we'll see you then. All right. All see right. you guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.